Thank you, Peter. Uh, that was uh, quite impressive. Uh, so I uh, will take questions during the round table. Um, my, the second speaker in the session is Soren Brunak. Soren Brunak is uh, one of the global leaders of uh, bioinformatics and computational biology. Uh, he is uh, affiliated with the Novo Nordisk Foundation Center of Protein Research in, at the University of Copenhagen and also with the University of Copenhagen Medical Center where he's leading a group that is called Translational Disease Systems Biology. What uh, in many sense uh, is pioneering the transition of computational biology from a more molecular base to more and more uh, focus on translational problems on molecular uh, um, uh, in, in medicine. To, to make this even more clear, Soren is now the medical informatics officer of the Rings Hospital in the capital region of Denmark. So this uh, exemplifies this transition from uh, computational biology and molecular biology to, to, to medicine and to medical problems. Uh, he's going to be talking about longitudinal phenotypes and disease trajectories at population scale. What we need in uh, precision medicine is obviously to, to look at the whole patient, and it's already been said by other speakers that we need a more holistic approach uh, where we are maybe not considering just one disease, but actually uh, the en entire disease trajectory that the patients uh, transverse over the uh, life course. And, and this is uh, where we need uh, harmonization of, of, of data and, of course, also replicated data sets in, in, in different countries that uh, go uh, way, way back. And, and in many ways in precision medicine, we would like to find biomarkers that drives disease progression rather than um, just uh, biomarkers that relate to one particular disease. So, uh, there's nothing wrong with just studying one disease, but at least one of the uh, more advanced aims is to, uh, to uh, look at this in a more life course oriented uh, way. And, and this is what many groups have started to, to do. Uh, but of course, there's a lot of, of standardization and compatibility issues when you would like to go back in time, because ideally we would like to go back 50 or 75 years. And of course, not all countries will have this kind of data. But I'll show you some slides on, 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 on part of the work that we have done and, and similar work is going on in, in, um, in, in many different countries at the, uh, at the moment. And of course, the idea is not to stratify uh, patients just from a single diagnosis, but, um, but uh, from their longitudinal pattern. And, and so each dot here is, is a diagnosis. And, and uh, then, of course, one can then see whether one can find uh, biomarkers for these different different patterns. So we need to work with electronic data that go uh, way uh, back. And um, it's interesting that when you look at how electronic health data are in different um, countries in, in, um, in Europe, uh, you see them here uh, colored in, in, in three different colors. Um, yellow here is the one payer systems and, and um, uh, blue is, is uh, insurance models. And then there are also um, in, uh, in pink other countries that have sort of a transition, transition situation. And you see the average for the one payer uh, model countries um, is, is to the left. So, so, so there's a lot more incentive uh, in the centralized one payer model countries to actually have the data uh, electronic. And in many cases, these countries also started uh, way back and you see some of the Nordic countries, but also large countries like Spain and, and, and UK up in the left end of, of, of this graph. So basically, when we would like to model uh, disease um, trajectories and causes. We need, for example, to look at, at diagnosis um, going, going back, and here they are color coded according to different disease areas in, in the WHO ICD-10 uh, system. 
And uh, we, we started doing this uh, some years ago uh, where we used uh, data from, from, from Denmark, um, around six, seven million uh, people. And you see again the color coding of the different uh, diagnoses and you see them divided into inpatients and outpatients and emergency room patients. And you see in green all the pregnancy related diagnoses, for example, for the females uh, that you are not seeing to, to, to the right. So in order to study um, disease trajectories, we need data uh, like this. And, and this is data from, from a sort of roughly 20-year uh, period, but actually in, in, in Denmark, we can go back to 77, and in some other countries, you can go even further back. Uh, and then we, of course, need to work with earlier version of, of, of ICD and try to harmonize. So this is one of the challenges in this uh, area where you would like to study the longitudinal patterns of disease development that you need to this backwards compatibility. And this is, of course, also something we need to, to think about when we collect uh, data uh, prospectively. So, so here you see another graph with the same colors on, on, on death registry data. These uh, death registries are, of course, some of the oldest ones. And you can go back to ICD-5 and ICD-6. And we've looked at, at how causes of death develop over, over time. But my point here is that, that uh, we need, if we want to study these um, uh, longitudinal patterns, actually to work across standards that also were implemented many, many years ago. Just very briefly, we developed uh, these approaches to see how uh, diagnosis followed um, uh, follow uh, after one another, and 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 you can you can display them as networks. Here's one for diabetes, and here's another one for for depression from a paper that just came out. You see depressive uh, episode in green in the middle, and then recurrent depressive disorder uh, in um, to the right. And then you see the diagnosis that came before these, uh, these diagnoses to the left and those after. And this is, of course, what we would like to use as sort of a template for, for the genomic data that you heard about in the previous talk, how to see whether the biomarker data can, can inform us on what direction uh, the patients will take in these networks. Here's another one on, on epilepsy. Uh, and, and we also have, have, have looked a lot at, at cancer data. So, so I'm just mainly flashing these to, to, to show you the idea that you actually can convert uh, data uh, from, for example, a 20 or 40 year period into these long trajectories. We even made a browser uh, with a Danish data where we use data from 7.2 million people and you can make your own uh, disease trajectories if you plug in diagnosis so you can interrogate data from an entire population without having any person sensitive data involved because this is all summary level data and of course it will be interesting to compare uh, disease progression patterns uh, from different countries but it requires that they are standardized in various ways and 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 then you can can compare and and, and see what will replicate across uh, popul uh, populations and what will not replicate. And then and there is a paper from last year on this. Here's one uh, on, on some uh, figure from on, on, on Down syndrome. But the main pattern is that the, the main message here is that um, uh, that that we see a development where uh, person sensitive data are converted into summary data that can be man manipulated without uh, going into a lot of applications for sensitive data that you have to to uh, to protect. I would like to in this um, talk also to point at one area that actually was also touched touch on in the of the in the, by the previous speaker in the previous session, namely this whole problem of noise um, in health care data, because we have a lot of miss and over and under diagnosis in healthcare data when we work uh, with it. And we should also consider how we clean, if we can, some of these um, um, uh, noise sources out of the data. We have used to that in bioinformatics, reducing noise in data, but this has not really been done systematically in a lot of the uh, disease res re registry da data sets, of course, in many quality databases, but not in sort of raw healthcare data. 
So there are many diseases where you where, where we have underdiagnosis or overdiagnosis. COPD is, is, is one of them. And uh, so there are patients uh, that will get the diagnosis who will not have it and, and also the, the opposite. And we actually used this longitudinal approach to see whether we could find some patients that, for example, had a COPD diagnosis uh, in a very unusual context where it didn't really fit in. So this is this gray J44 diagnosis, and you see some disease trajectories that are common below, and then you see some unusual patients that, that suddenly have this um, uh, diagnosis. And it's interesting in this, this work, again, I will not go into the detail, it was just uh, published, that some of these overdiagnosed patients that we found in the data, they actually die earlier than the, um, the sort of average COPD patient. And one should think that when you, you are overdiagnosed, then you would actually live longer. But then when we looked into it, it was interesting that, that these overdiagnosed uh, patients, they actually split it into two groups where, where some maybe are truly overdiagnosed and they actually lived longer when you look at a survival curve. Uh, but also when, when you look at a, at a part of them, they might be uh, really misdiagnosed and, and they could, for example, be underdiagnosed for, for lung cancer um, in, in, instead and then not treated for the lung cancer. So this was also what the previous speaker alluded to. to and and my, my point is here, and, and in the paper, we go into how we actually can use lab values to, to uh, substantiate that these patients did not have COPD, but they actually had lung cancer. So there are a lot of details in this one, but my point is that we should work together on how we clean up data and actually also try to bring down the level of human error, because of course in, 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 um, in healthcare, misdiagnosis and overdiagnosis and underdiagnosis will happen. But when we would like to use the data for making conclu conclusions and, 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 and predictions and so on, then, um, then we, we in some cases need to try to bring the noise level down. So I also would like to point at how we can use this long longitudinal data in, um, in a predictive sense. And we started some years ago to do this on, on uh, intensive care patients. And uh, actually a lot of the registry data we have around the world is not used very much in actual treatment of the patients themselves. And uh, we tried in, 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 in this paper to see whether we could use the, the patient trajectory for one patient in the, in the analysis of the mortality chances for, for, for one patient. And very sort of simple idea, we take a machine learning algorithm, we plug the disease history into the network, and we might also um, plug in a lot of vitals, and then we can see how the two types of data, they actually um, fare when we would like to, for example, uh, predict 30 or 90 day mortality of, of, of the, um, the patients. And it was very interesting that when you look at the orange bar here in terms of performance, that the disease history is actually more powerful than these vitals you pick up after 24 hours. That means that the disease history can, um, uh, can be used actually to predict a mortality even before uh, the patient has been transferred to, to intensive care. But of course, if you put the two types of data together, then you get the green performance here and, and, and then it, it becomes uh, even better. But that's another point I would like to make. We should be better to use the patient's own historic data and longitudinal data in the treatment of this specific pa patient and then give something back to the patient inst instead of just using it uh, prospectively as most epimediology has, has done. Uh, some of these um, um, thoughts can, of course, also be used for many other data types, lab values I've mentioned already, but also drugs, and, and, and one can analyze um, uh, prescription registries, and we also have started doing uh, that, where we actually take uh, billions of, 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 of um, um, uh, prescriptions and see uh, look into the, the patterns. And I will, again, not go into the details, but I'm just like to stress that we need to work with, with standards on, on how to, to keep um, longitudinal data in, um, in a form uh, where they can be integrated across data types, 
uh, but of course also linked to, to molecular um, uh, level uh, biomarker uh, data. So life course data, uh, um, also previous speakers touched on, on, on this, is of course not just molecular data and, and, and clinical data, it's also socioeconomic data. And that will also play a, a strong role in, in, in uh, sort of transforming the um, analysis scene in, in, in around longitudinal data in, in, um, in, in the future. And uh, of course, there are many classical um, socioeconomic data that, that, that should come in here. Um, but, um, but there are also new data that also earlier speakers pointed at this. I'll just uh, highlight one type of, of, of data. That's the smart meter data that I, I um, show here last that, that, that measures how you use your electricity and, uh, at home. And that can, of course, be uh, used in the analysis of, for example, of sleeping patterns and that, that sort of thing. So we will see new long, longitudinal data type uh, appear in the precision medicine uh, space. But what I'm uh, finally saying here is that uh, why what can we get out of, of the longitudinal uh, perspective? And um, in some sense, what we want to do is also to redefine phenotypes uh, as trajectories and then put them into infrastructures and not just stay with the single disease analysis um, and, and, and so on. So it's also about creating new ontologies for what disease progression uh, actually is. And, and we have registries in this domain because it's hard to work with the uh, live data, of course, also for privacy uh, issues. But, but, but this would, of course, be the optimal that we, in a secure way, could work with the live data. We've seen in COVID-19 how important it is to, to not wait one or two years uh, before we can gain access to, to, uh, to data. So the live data perspective is also very uh, important. So here's um, uh, my acknowledgements in, in the group for some of these people who, who did the work. Um, but thank you for your attention. Again, also thank you for the, um, the invitation and sorry about the, the camera problem here.